My little attempt at a presentation tonight is about, well, you guessed it if you can see the screen, three blacks. And I say for watercolors, but that's probably because only watercolors would ever want three blacks. And black has always been one of those things that it's like the devil. People say, oh, I'll never use a black. And I've seen watercolor artists that say that and famous ones. And then they've got indigo or Payne's gray or something like that in their palette. So they're really using black anyway. But I'm gonna look at these three blacks today, lamp black, ivory black, and that one's called lunar black. The tube dried up, so I cut it out of the tube and I made it into a little stick called Mars black, the official name. I don't know if you've seen this painting. Claude Monet is painting by the edge of the wood by John Singer Sargent. They had about a decade there where they painted together in France. And uh, there's a story in Monet's memoirs where he talks about Sargent asking him to borrow his palette. And then Sergeant got, he says, where's your black? When I says, I never use black. And so Sergeant said, there's, well, there's no way I can paint without black. So what's wrong with black? Uh, this slide kind of demonstrates it. On the left, I've painted some phthalo blue and some black and the black, and, and they're wet at that point. And the black looks really nice and dark. But then after it dries, you can see that it's uh, much duller. It dulled a lot more than the blue did. And this is because black is, most of your blacks are made of carbon and they scatter light. So they end up reflecting more white light, which makes something look dull. The blacks that we have now are mostly made from things that are burnt, like burnt oil, burnt wood, coal. And these were discovered probably right after they discovered fire. As soon as they burned something, they said, hey, look, I can draw the end of this stick. And those are pretty much the same blacks we're still using today. Very little has changed. In the Middle Ages, the, the smithies that made weapons came up with a black that's made out of iron ore, but, and they called it Mars Black. Since they were making the instruments of war, and Mars was the god of war, they called it Mars Black. And the only thing since then, through all modern history, is this one that's on this slide. It's called Perylene Black. How does it look to you? Looks a little green. It's, great. it's actually very green. Right. It doesn't show up quite as well as green on the screen here, but it is really, in fact, sometimes it's called perylene green. That is the only new black that man has discovered in all that time. So that didn't leave a lot of choices. Now black comes, like I said, from things that are burnt. And if you look at uh, an oil lamp burning, it collects the soot in the chimney, like you see in this picture. And even uh, some of them might get on the ceiling. It's because the particles of soot are so lightweight and small that they're carried just by heat. You could scrape that off there and make it into a pigment. That would be called lamp black because it's made from burning oil. But these lightweight particles, when you suspend these particles in oil or acrylic, they stay in their position. But you, when you put them on water, because they're so lightweight, they'll flow across the water. The three blacks I'm gonna look at are ivory black, lamp black, and Mars black. This is ivory black, which tends to be a little more pale and a little warmer than lamp black. Lamp black's on the, on the right. But both of these were applied on the same kind of paper and let dry. And you can see that the ivory black has particles that coagulate and gravitate to the paper and make what we watercolors call granulation. So there's two blacks, which are pretty much the same color. Uh, I doubt that an oil artist would want to have both of them because they're so close to each other. There's no reason to. An oil artist or acrylic artist is looking at the color, not whether it granulates. So there might be a reason for watercolors to have both of these. Look at the lamp black on the right. You'll see that it has kind of a faint edging to it gets a little bit blacker at the edge. This is those lightweight particles. Any puddle of water will have an edge. The edges will be thinner. So the particles will be drawn to the edge a little bit. And on the ivory, it doesn't happen. That's because the particles sink faster. We got the same, same swatches here right before they totally dried. I dropped in some water. And you can see that the ivory responds a little bit kind of an ugly way, it leaves some of the particles behind, but the lamp, 
black where the very light particles are scattered quite a bit, leaving almost pure white paper behind. So that's something you can do with that. In this uh, slide, I go ahead and add Mars black. <clears throat> now Mars black is for an oil artist or acrylic is the most opaque of the blacks. It's the strongest and most opaque. What I've done here is just put a little bit of the pigment in water. And you can see that it has a very fine granulation. There at the bottom, you can see how it even collects and pools. You also, this is a rough paper. You can also see how the lamp black, despite the fact that it's a rough paper, leaves a nice smooth finish. Whereas the ivory black still granulates and the particles sink down into the low spots of the paper. This is another example of Mars black applied thickly and then allowed to be diluted on one side. If you apply it thickly, obviously you're not going to see granulation. In order to see granulation, you have to see some of the paper come through, but you do see granulation over to the right. Hmm. This is a, just a quick sketch done with lamp black. And you can see how I've used some of the characteristics of lamp black. It's black, I put a couple swatches with a brush across the top, let it almost dry and came back right about in here and I dropped a drop of water here and here. And that pushed some of the black back to create some edges that are kind of simulate clouds. And then down in this area, this went across here after it was almost dry, I came back with a little bit of water to make it kind of simulate foliage. And over in the foreground, these trees, which were just painted on obviously with stronger black, you can see what happens if it's let to sit. Some of the black pigments will go to the edge. So instead of just ending up with a solid black silhouette, we have kind of an edged silhouette that's lighter in the center because some of those particles of black went out to the edge. And one of the tricks is using plenty of water. In this one, I painted uh, water and lamp black for the rocks and then came back and added Mars black and coaxed the Mars black to go to the edges. So if you look at the edges of the rocks, in a few places, you'll see a little extra black. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'll show you how that's done in a minute. This is an example of adding Mars black to a very dull violet, perylene violet. <clears throat> and we can see here how we can control somewhat the granulation. If you put it on thick enough, like you see behind her head up here, you can't see the granulation because the paint's thick. There's no paper showing through. Then you can have partial granulation like I have here, but all and a little bit right here. But in here, in the bath water, I let it sit and it granulates quite a bit. And the nice thing about granulation with watercolor is it helps bring things forward, just like a bright color brings things forward because it simulates detail. It makes the minds see as though there some, must be some detail there because there's some uh, shapes. This is another one. This is a uh, just a close-up of tile that I have in a painting and I wanted to simulate marble. So I'll throw in water. I threw in some ultramarine blue, some cobalt teal blue, which are both kind of sinkers. They stay, they don't completely spread out. As you can see, there's like, here's, here's where I dropped some ultramarine blue here. There's a little bit of cobalt teal. And then I added the Mars black and again, coax some of it to the edges, like right here, right here, right down here. All right. And this coaxing, I'm going to, that's what my little demo is going to do. I'm going to go over to my other one. Now. But Am I over here now? Sorry. Yes. All right. And what I've got here is a little of the Mars black. I just mixed this right before I started this presentation. I don't know if you can see it there. It looks like a little black dot, but above that All black right. dot is water. It's just, it just totally sank to the bottom. If I... Mix it up a little bit, you'll see it all come back to life. Mm. Okay. Mm. It sinks very quickly, and that's what it's going to do here on the paper. And I'm going to do just a little quick wash right here. Now remember, this paint came from the Middle Ages, or this pigment, and it's made from iron ore. You also see it's almost impossible for me to keep making streaks, even though I'm hardly even touching the paper because it, the paint pigment is so heavy, as soon as it, as it gets to the paper, it drops immediately and sticks. I'm gonna give it a little whirl here and mix it up a little. 
Okay, you can see, I'm sure, how much it's granulated. But, made of iron. So, I'm gonna get me a little magnet here. Watch the magic. Can you see that? Yes. <laughs> Pull the pigment around with a magnet and create a sharp edge. And that's what I did, for example, with the, the rock wall that I showed you earlier and also with the, the tile, the blue tile. So for an oil artist, having multiple blacks probably doesn't make a lot of sense. And for most people using black to do things like shadows and, and large dark areas is not advisable because the paint dries so dull. But for situations like this, where you wanna play with it a little bit, you wanna create, I often keep lamp black in my palette and I'll add a little bit to create an edge where I want a little sharper edge. That's one thing that's good for. All right, that's all I have and I'm gonna close this one down now.